Andy. Thanks a lot. So welcome everyone. Uh, so in the next uh, 60 minutes to give or take, we're going to share a few details uh, about the program. We have uh, Christian with us from the program team. And uh, that would be, if, if you have questions on the Finite program as well, uh, Fanny's can uh, take questions as well. Um, I know that we've done a little bit of introduction, but for the sake of the recordings, if we can go again, uh, maybe uh, with Christian, uh, Fanny's and myself. So I am Diego um, and uh, I will be hosting this session. I've been volunteer for your Python for the last three years um, in different um, different roles. So this year I would be more focusing on the program team and in the mentorship program as well. Funny, so Christine. Yeah, as like we did the interactions before the recording. Um, from my side, I can say that uh, I'm very happy that this is, I think, the third year that we host the the same uh, session. Um, I think we we are trying to do things uh, different, and um, I like that people are interested in joining the mentorship program. And uh, of course, a big thanks to Christian uh, because he's from the program team and uh, he's here today to to reply to to any questions that people might have for for the call for proposals uh one thing i can share like um that the mentorship program is here to help anyone like who wants help with their proposal so even if uh, the the form like a form is closed or whatever please feel free to ping us uh, through the channels of EuroPython or uh, send us an email at support or helpdesk at europython.eu or program at europython.eu and we can like uh, reply to you and help you go through the process of uh, submitting a proposal or if you want to help with your proposal in general, like to review it, uh, we are here to help. Uh, and I think I can give you the, the floor now, Diego, again. Great, and maybe do you want to... Yeah, sure. Yeah, I know. I mean, for, for the folks here offline, we already introduced ourselves. My name is Christian. I'm currently working and helping EuroPython with the program. Um, it's really important, at least that's the message that I want to, to spread here for the people joining now online or watching this afterwards, is that please do not keep questions for yourself. And instead of assuming some stuff that might not be clear, please let us know. There, The email contacts and the contact emails are on the website. The earlier you write us, the earlier we can rep uh, reply to you. And you, my, most of your questions might be questions of other people. So it's really important for us and for you that we can clarify everything. Uh, but on the other hand, if everything is super clear, then we are happy that you understood everything. But yeah, just speak up with whatever question you have, please reach to the organization team so we can help you. All right, thanks, Fanny and Christian. So um, I think the, the core day of the session today is a Q&A, so it will be more for you to ask us questions. But before uh, getting there, I think it's uh, more beneficial, uh, for instance, for the for for Christians to share information about the the, the CFP uh, process and uh, kind of related information then of course if you have more tailored questions then uh feel free feel free, feel free to ask yeah is that, so is that question? that's very well i will i was thinking that i could attempt to maybe screen uh, share my screen i don't i think that i i need to be a host or something to do it so if someone can enable me maybe we can do the little exercise of trying to to go through the process so we can point you to the really important bits and, and if i somehow suddenly disappear please don't be afraid uh, it's mainly that my computer don't like uh zoom so now you will see a really ugly square on the yeah. on the top and i will not be able to do anything with that so i'm really sorry about it but you can see the content of the website which is the most important bit uh, so I really hope that everyone here is already at uh, the website. I mean, as you know, it already is uh, ep2024.europython.eu. Uh, besides a few blog posts that there are there for, for quite some time now, you will find that the menu will start being populated little by little. And one of the things that, of course, we have is the call for proposals. 
So the goal for proposals, the whole structure, if you are a person that participated in the previous event, you know already the deal, but if you don't, here we have most of the information with regarding the goal for proposal. Of course, if you if you don't want to read anything, want to jump into submitting your application, you can do it like this, but I really encourage you to give it a read. There are some general advice. There are some general explanations. Some people might be completely new to the conference, so they don't know like the amount of activities that we do, the format, the time, the levels, all the, the, the topics that we are discussing, how do we select this thing, which is a really important thing. It is something that I really enjoy from the EuroPython is that there is not only a group of reviewers uh, looking at your talks, but former participants of the conference and speakers of the conference are also able to build up and help building up the amazing schedule of the conference. Uh, Fanny's was mentioning before that, of course, we do have mentorship in case there are first-time speakers. This is crucial because, of course, people, everyone was here already a junior when they started, so nobody was born expert in some module. So it's really do not be afraid that, oh, because I never given a talk, maybe will not be accepted. That might not be the case. So please um, consider it and the other information that you can see here about the support or stand with open source, the nonprofit um, quality of the uh, EuroPython foundations and so on and so forth. So let's go to submitting a proposal. We will not read everything, don't worry about it, but if you click this amazing button here, uh, I specifically am not logging in here because I didn't want it to show other options, but this text might look like a lot. I really recommend you to read it and to read it slowly with a cup of coffee or tea or whatever you prefer to drink. Why? Because of this specific point. I cannot tell you the amount of people that had amazing ideas, really, really, really cool projects, and they are doing like groundbreaking things, but because they cannot express that on a small abstract for your proposal, they cannot participate in events. So take some minutes, read this little section that we wrote down with giving you the keys of a good proposal. Uh, and with that information, you will be able to at least have a well-structured abstract. And of course, the decision of the talks and proposal is always around like the importance of the topics, the, the interesting bits of it. Um, but please give it a read. Even if you are providing the, you know, the, the cure to all the bugs in the Python uh, ecosystem, if you don't have a good abstract, that might not be accepted. So some people I know that they, they get a little bit confused because we have two kind of like pages in pre -talks. So you go here first, then you read everything, you are ready to go, and then you say, okay, let's do this. And you go there and there will be more information. Most of the information that you will see here on the second page is what is already on the website. The reason that we have it in two times, maybe you're thinking, wait, why you didn't just skip this part, is because some people sometimes arrive directly to pre-talks and some people stick only with the information at the website. So just to be double sure, we put all this information that I was mentioning beforehand here. So check it out in any case if you didn't before on the website and then you are ready for the proposal. One specific change that we did this year, if you are an all first, uh, an all EuroPython attendee or a speakers, is that we understand that for some people it might be a little bit frustrating to understand the difference. What is an abstract? What is a description? What is this? You know, there are like many fields that sometimes you need to 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 have. Now the proposal is quite straightforward. You need to have a title and an abstract as a main major things. Right. So here you see you write a proposal title, you select the type of, uh, of the talk that you want to give, the track that will have many topics around PyData, microcontrollers, core of Python, and many other things. You write your abstract, you put some notes that are not for reviewers, are only for organizers in case you need to share something interesting. But on the next um, on the next step, there is a new field. I, I mean, I can try to do it now with some random data. Please do not submit data like this. Uh, for example, let's do this. And uh, let's do some content here. If we try to continue. Now we have a field called outline. This is really important because you can have a good abstract, 
but maybe you are not telling me what you are really going to talk in your co in your talk. So I mean, if tomorrow, for example, I want to give you an amazing overview of LLMs and I talk about the importance of LLMs and all the groundbreaking things we have nowadays and stuff like that, I really don't know what are you talking about. I mean, are you solving something with Python or just giving a summary? So having an outline, outline is crucial. I do recommend you to put there some items that you will discuss together with some elapsed time. That's also a, a trick that only the people watching this video can know. Right? If you have the outline with some timing next to it, you, you for certain will have extra points <laughs> from some of the reviewers because that's really important. And then all the rest of the information, which is something that you should be used to it because it's something that we have been doing the last year. So as a summary, you will have your proposal title abstract, only abstract, don't worry about whatever in the description, but then fill out the outline section. So yeah, without into going into many details, I would say Diego and Fanny that this is a good like a summary of the whole process of the submissions. And maybe we can see if we have any questions. Yeah, no, this is uh, excellent, I would say, uh, because you covered basically the uh, the whole process. Yeah, it, it doesn't look uh, uh, too complicated, but I just want to stress the importance of the abstract and the outline, because imagine that uh, the program team needs to evaluate uh, dozens of these, uh, well, maybe hundreds of these, um, of these proposals, and then we need to... Um, and we don't have infinite time to go in many details in, in many of them. And uh, so the, the 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 abstract and the outlines are really, really uh, the two main items that we use to judge, uh, okay, we can make the, we want this presentation or not uh, in the schedule. Of course, there would be other factors like uh, uh, duplicate uh, presentations and then uh, find how many presentations we have in a specific track, so these kind of things we need to. Uh, there are lots of variables when uh, create a program, but from your side, the best thing that you can do is, uh, as Christian said, well, read all the information, uh, have a, 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 a better view of what uh, we expect, and then do your best to fill out the abstract and the outline. I think this is the best you can do. A part of your um your best idea of uh that you have that you want to share in the in the in the in the Europe at Europe Python. Um Panis, do you have any anything to share uh, before we open up to, to questions? I can say only that this year again uh we will run a final a fina the fina financial aid uh program. Uh, we aim it to start early next month. Of course, announcements will be made on time in order for everyone to know. Um, and we will uh, try to um, have an acceptance round as soon as possible. Uh, I'm not part of the financial aid team, but I can share this information for now. Uh, and one thing that I I can highlight in order for people to know is that uh, it does like if someone uh, is an accepted speaker in Europe Python, uh, it is uh, it, it is taken into account that someone is a speaker, so it might get like priority in order to have financial aid. But everyone, everyone has to fill in the form that we will announce that uh, for the financial aid. So it doesn't matter if someone has already uh, created a proposal or submitted a proposal or. Uh, even registered for to be a volunteer in Europe Python, everyone has to to submit uh, to to register for the financial aid in order to be considered as a candidate for the grant. And it's important to that because in some conference, some people get confused that even if you is your first time at Europe Python, even if you haven't submit anything, you can still apply for grants. Sometimes people is afraid, thinking like, oh, no, because if I do it, I have met many times in many conferences, and particularly your Python, that people that it's first time, they, you know, they, they, they wrote a good proposal, but of course, write a good proposal and fill all the information. So please don't consider that that uh, as a stopping thing. So you, you can just do it. Yes, um, first question. Yes. Um, can we submit multiple proposals? Yes. And I encourage you to submit 
all the ideas that you believe are important. And of course, I understand that the creation of a good proposal sometimes takes time. For some people, it's really easy. For some people, it's only like, ah, whatever, I just write this. But for some people, it takes time because maybe it's something ongoing or whatever. So I will encourage you to submit as many as good proposals as you had enough time to prepare. I see in some conference people sending in a huge amount, a really large amount of proposals, and none of them get accepted because the quality is not very good. But on the other hand, you have people sending only one, but since they you know, took some time, asked some people for feedback, they managed to have a really good proposal. So yeah, in short, yes, submit as, as, as much as you can, but please t take care of the quality of those. Also, I think um, because we want to give um, um, the uh, opportunity to, to to be a speaker to as many people as possible, I think even if you submit three proposals, I mean, if we're going to pick, we pick one, not two from the same person. So exactly, um, uh, I think, uh, I mean, yes, you can submit multiple proposals, but um this doesn't mean that you have more chances to be selected it depends it, it really depends on the quality of the proposals because yeah. again we need to con uh, we need to have the uh we have lots of variables as i said different uh, duplicate talks and different tracks uh, and stuff so we need to balance we need uh, create a schedule is a is a balance a balance act uh from different variables i would say and it's super funny, important. yes, finally share the financial aid uh, page with e, which is uh, ep twenty twenty four european dot eu slash finaid, and uh, yes, you can check there for uh, for for announcements. Uh, and also, one thing I could also share is that uh, regarding the visa process, because I know that some people. Uh, are very interested into the into applying for a visa in order to attend Europython. Uh, the visa process normally starts uh, in parallel with the tickets. Uh, so, um, one thing I could share for for the people interested is that uh, most probably um, in early March or mid March we will we will have announced the tickets. So we will uh, also start the the visa program the, because we. We provide uh, reco uh, uh, visa support letters to to attendees, but uh, in order to do that, someone has already to, has to buy a ticket in order to do that. Mm. And it's important. I mean, that topic is something that sadly we don't have a lot of control on the visas because different embassies react different ways. They require sometimes more information, less information. Check out your local uh, embassy or or whatever, like to see, for example, how fast you can get an appointment. I have some experience from other conference and sometimes people really need to wait many months in order to, even years, but that's a really extreme case. But so check out, I mean, it would, should be your embassy, so language shouldn't be an issue. Maybe give them a call, like say, hey, how quick I can get a visa because I am planning to do, I am certain that those places will be happy to reply to you. So please try to plan this very well because visas are complicated, sometimes takes a lot of time and you cannot see and in case you were a uh, speaker waiting for a visa, this kind of call complicates your side of the story because it's a great opportunity for you, but also for us because we will need to somehow rearrange the program, try to make some exceptions or like empty spaces there. So give your embassy a call, see how often, you, how quick you can get them and plan accordingly with the dates. Are there any other questions? Uh, feel free to unmute yourself or use the chat. I can break the ice if you want. Yeah, to. yeah, go for it. I would like to know more about the selection process. Like I submit a proposal here, of course, but then how my my talk is selected. So I have a special coin here that I flip, and if it hits, no, no, no. Of course, the process is way more complicated than that. I would say that people should write papers on how selection process work. So in every conference and every year, this, the situation varies a little bit regarding like the time slots of each process. But in a nutshell, what we will do this year is similar to what we did last year. So there will be after the review from our reviewer's team, it's done. 
we will have, you know, some score related to all the proposals. But then we will also have as an input data the the opinions and the votes of former speakers of EuroPython. So you have like two sets of uh, points that you need to somehow compare and balance out. There is a lot of work in the middle because we understand that, of course, some people can give a review really contradictory to another one. So at least uh, as a program team, we need to be in charge of checking most, if not every single comment to see like, oh, maybe this person by mistake gave a zero or a minus one rather than a two. So there needs to be some like cleaning in, in that regard. So with those set of inputs, usually we have two lists in a certain priority order. You can easily like mix them up. But something that is really important is that there will be some balancing things. So there needs to be then some proportions regarding the topics that people is uh, talking this year. Uh, we understand um, because of the last year, all the AI um, popularity that the amount of the, for example, Pi data related talks that we get will be huge compared to, I don't know, people doing video games or people doing IoT. This does not say that if you submit in those programs, you will have higher chances of, of getting accepted because it should be unfair for the other folks but it might help you a little bit so i will say that really try to consider that i mean if you are really into all these popular topics nowadays like some web technologies or some ai related topics give you your chance but maybe you also have topics in other in other areas that uh, you might like want to submit so i cannot tell you of course that we will select and fix amount of talks per uh, different topic but we will need to balancing out because we understand that we have so many different profiles in the Python community and so many different profiles attending the group Python. So after all this process is done, I, I don't know if how, how long should we take, but I think that it was around two weeks or three weeks. I don't know, but we will hope to do it as fast as possible. I mean, everyone reviewing proposals are volunteers, like you can be in case you are interested. Uh, but hopefully this uh, after those two things are considered and then we need to start creating a program. Something maybe just to add, you might when we get the first results out, you might get, of course, your talk accepted, you might get your talk rejected, but also you might get your talk on a waiting list. This is usually because sometimes we have cancellations last minute. Sometimes we know people that are, you know, willing to say, "Oh, no, I can, I will go to the conference in any in any way." So, if my talk is on the on the waiting list, consider my uh, me to 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 fill some spots. All these kind of things needs to be rearranged. So you could still, if you are on the waiting list, get a chance of getting your talk. Like you're a Python, so that's really important to have. Uh, Christian, I think uh, I have a follow up question. So I think you mentioned reviewers, so you mentioned past uh, speakers, but is there any uh, public voting as well, like we did last year's? Yeah, there will be the, the well, the public, but I think that the public is only for speakers of EuroPython, as far as I know. If you get to the, the, the community voting, I think that is for people that I know. It's for ticket holdings, I think. It's, yeah. it's ticket holders. Sorry for everyone that, that have attended since uh, 2015. 15. Okay, so yeah, all the uh, people there. That's the community voting that I was uh, referring to. I mistakenly said speaker, but thank you, Diego. It's everyone. So yeah, I mean, uh, besides this voting, I guess that you want me to ask the next question, right? So if there is any priority. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, so the, the, there is a question in the chat. Uh, ah, yeah, I can, I can, I will read it maybe. Uh, so we have a question by Shiva that says, "Our speaker with prior speaking experience prioritize over first time speakers? Any advice for aspiring first time speakers?" So the whole process of review is an anonymous process. Um, so once we get the data, of course, it's a, the core program committee will check that list out. And then we need to give a, start to make a decisions about it, right? Because there are a lot of things that we will need to uh, balance besides the topics, the speakers, and at least it's really dear to my heart that having first-time speaker is a must, right? Because we need those first-time speakers not to become first-time speaker any longer and become like really advanced or good speakers in the past. And without giving, it's like the same junior, senior kind of like approach, right? 
So I do have, um, personally, like, uh, I really would like to give the opportunity to many of those people. The amount will really depend of uh, how the things are, but it's not like we will say, like, oh, let's say 10 first-time speaker or whatsoever. No. Proposals are, like, evaluated, but once we have a selection of the talks, we will need to make a decision and maybe try to dig more into the speaker's um, uh, details as a core uh, program committee because... We want to follow what Fanny's and Diego was mentioning before that we would like to have one person per proposals accepted, accepted proposals. And also we need to like really want to see like if we have like too many like speakers with a lot of experience that not many with the uh, first time ones, we might get into, into the situation that we will start to uh, improve the, the list with regard to the first time speakers. So I'd say that the, the only advice it might sound like a broken record, but I have tried this in many conferences. Please format your abstract well. I'm not saying that like the format format, but uh, the structure. If you follow the advices that I was showing beforehand, explaining the context, why the program is uh, the the the, the solution, sorry, the problem you have, it's important to be solved, and why your solution is uh, crucial for this thing to to succeed. I think that. That's really, really, really crucial. You can even give an introduction to a module, but if you have a good abstract, that talk has a lot of more potential because I have reviewed talks in the past that the abstract was literally like, I would like to give an introduction to pandas. That is not a good abstract because that's something that you can do with one Google away or one query to any LLM, right? So you need to sell your idea. You need to provide, Provide to every single reviewer, like, hey, my talk will be amazing. So, yeah, I will I just say, like, massage your abstract in a way that, you know, it's a really good uh, elevator pitch of your of your proposal. If I can then follow up on uh, what Christian said, if you are a first-time speaker, uh, we are running the the the, the, the our mentorship program. Uh, Fanny shared the link on the chat, which is the EuroPython website slash mentorship. You can sign up there as a mentee, for instance. Then you would be paired uh, with a with a mentor. Uh, we uh, who will help you to create uh, a proposal, and then if your proposal will be accepted, then you have this one-to-one -one relationship with uh, someone more experienced than you, then we'll help you to uh, with your presentation, to rehearse your presentation, then uh, we'll follow, kind of, we'll, we'll give you some confidence that uh, what you're doing is, uh, is a good job. So if you're interested, you can uh, sign up there. So there is another uh, question uh, from Sina. Thanks a lot for uh, spending your time, sharing your this valuable insight with us. Um, may, I ask if, <clears throat> may I ask, is there a difference between the proposals that has a demo uh, versus the ones that are more involved in sharing suggestions for that specific topic? Uh, because as a junior, I sometimes feel more valued by others if I show someone something I worked on instead of me generally sharing my idea of or, or knowledge without a demo backing up my opinion? That's a really good question. And yes. I say that it's an open question that still exists in any conference you have there. There is a lot of people that value having demos on the presentation because of the interest, interactive aspects that your uh, session can have. Sometimes live demos can generate a different a reaction on the audience because of course if you're looking at someone writing something creating something in front of you is different if you're just explaining it on the other hand i do know that there are some people understanding like oh well cool i can do a demo myself after all the knowledge that these things are providing i say that whatever you are doing it could be even a, i have seen this in some conference like a presentation with other slides so, you know, someone just talking about some specific topic. It really will depend on whatever you are doing. Since you are a junior, I'd say that maybe you can sparkling like some, I don't know, snippets of code. If you are writing something from scratch, for example, or you are, let's say, like, again, I will naively assume some LLM data science things. If you're creating an amazing model to do something specific, maybe you can share a little bit of... Uh, snippets in your slides that do, you know, uh, a thing that you feel proud of, 
Uh, but I will not be too worried that you need to have something fully working, like, you know, end-to-end -end demo working, whatever, or live or whatever. You can even, like, if you have something, you can even record a video and show it. If you don't have something and you want to maybe explain what are you doing before creating your uh, this, like, full application, I say that you can share them as well. So I personally don't believe that it's a must. I do know that for some reviewers that's really important because they want to know, see like, okay, you are talking too much, but then well, show me whatever you did, right? But uh, I think that that's, that would really be uh, as a personal level. So if you can do a demo, add it. But I would say that it's not really a hard requirement. And again, the mentorship program that Diego and, and Fanny were mentioning before is something that could help you because without many details of your proposals, maybe we cannot like advise you like do a demo or not do a demo. But I must say that in some conference, for example, lately I was in this... Uh, in a conference in Prague, Python Pizza Prague. And there were some many of those talks that they had really interesting uh, talks and they ended up with a demo. So, you know, this like give you the final boom. But some of them didn't have any demo and they were really good talks as well. So maybe join the mentorship program and, and we could advise you more precisely, precisely in your case. If I can give another kind of opinion on the demo, sure. the demo is hard. <laughs> And uh, the the problem of the demo, uh, of the live demo, that can go wrong, right? So <laughs> it's so if you consider doing a demo, the the suggest or you want to show something uh, kind of interactive. I know that is is kind of a um, it's a, what I'm going to say is against the interactivity, but. If you want to show something, maybe it's better to have a backup plan, like a, a recorded video of what you want to show. Because while you're there on stage, then you need to type, you need to read notes, type, and at the same time, you need to talk right to your audience. So uh, it's very hard to get all these things right. So sometimes uh, a, a recorded video while you're explaining uh, it might be a better option. But again, it's not that uh, a demo is a no-no, but there are things to consider when you do a demo. For instance, even you might have even technical challenges if you if your demo relies on network connectivity. But for whatever reason, while you're presenting, the network goes down, then you cannot do the demo. So I think uh, depending on the demo, uh, you need to be careful how you want to structure it. So... If you choose it, choose wisely how you run the demo. Backup plan is the video recording, or maybe find another way to convey your message. But I mean, we can cover the demo things maybe in the next session. But <clears throat> I think it's hard. Even experienced speakers sometimes prefer not to do a demo <laughs> because, uh, well, uh, it, well, it, it, and then also it depends on on you uh, as a speaker. Uh, if if the demo goes wrong, you need to be um kind of confident to kind of um to own the presentation in a sense that then you can stay away from the 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 demo that went wrong and then continue with the, your presentation because the audience doesn't don't want the audience doesn't want to be to see you fixing the problem it wants to exactly see, uh, giving the uh the, the presentation so i think uh the demo is a uh, um it's a is a tricky one but uh it's not um well the best presentation i've seen are demo well kind of uh um made but i, I realized that they are very very hard to make um is that is there anything else on the chat uh yeah, for mentees, Fanny's shared the um, form to sign up as a mentee. And I think that's it. Uh, so if you have it, uh, Fanny's, yes, carry on. Yeah, one thing that I would like to share is that I have in mind that uh, after the call for proposals are is is closed, and then after we have the selected speakers, and pretty much we are starting to uh, create like the program team starts creating this uh, schedule, we will also host the first time speaker workshop, which is a, a session that we host every year, like uh, one or two months 
before the conference so we can give uh, ideas, advice, uh, help to first time speakers. Uh, we normally we have uh, experienced speakers there uh, sharing advice, uh, people asking questions about their uh, their very cases and uh, is a, is a very 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 nice um, workshop in general. I will share the links to the previous uh, to the previous one, the recording of the previous one, so people can maybe take an idea from there. Um, and and a, a question that I have to Christian is that uh, maybe we can share some statistics from the last year, like uh, how many proposals we had and how many got accepted. Sure, I can open here. So we did have, let me just go back to free talks 2023. There were, uh, I think, sessions. I can read like 600 something, well, 633 sessions in total that were submitted to the to EuroPython. Uh, something quite important here is that also if you check, like, for example, the amount of reviews, there were thousands of reviews. But in total, from these 600 something, there were that were confirmed and uh, started to participate in the conference were around 194. So we do are talking about like, of course, I mean, you need to consider that this number is not a fixed number, but this consider posters, talks, tutorials, you know, all this kind of thing. So maybe if we go only for the tutorials and confirm, for example, we do have 18 as you were around because that's the maximum slots that we can have. But on the side of the talks, we had around 130 talks accepted. And of course, these talks include all the formats of talk that we had last year. So there is a lot of uh, uh, <laughs> a lot of uh, proposals that need to be rejected, sadly, because not we cannot treat everyone. Well, maybe we can have a, a month of conference, <laughs> but uh, also the number of accepted one is not uh, so too low. So I would say that uh, people should not be discouraged that uh, people is sending some uh, proposal for the many uh, different activities that we have in the in the conference. Right. Um, the, no, we don't have any other questions. Uh, oh, the, yes, funny. Uh, shared the um, last year first time speaker workshop recordings if you want to watch it. Feel free to ask us anything about the program or Finate. Just one thing that I didn't share and I will share it right now is the email that if people like after the meeting have questions regarding the program, yes. oh, our list should oh. ask questions. I wanted to, I was looking for it right away. So yes, you read my mind. Thank you. Because we understand sometimes people will watch this thing afterwards or maybe now you cannot, maybe you're on your way home or something and then you can drop us an email. Uh, we, we, uh, not, yes, it's program at europython.eu. And also, I think if you want to keep uh, to be up to date with uh, all the latest development of uh, europython, that would be program anything related to europython. I suggest you anyway to follow uh Europython on on Twitter or X or and LinkedIn. So we have regular kind of communications uh and there will be communications about the CFP uh, results as well. So I think uh follow the, the socials uh of Europython. Also um Another thing I want to share is that, I mean, if you submit a proposal and the proposal is not accepted, it doesn't mean that the proposal is bad, but uh, it means that that we need to consider, as I say, lots of variables to to create a program 
and uh, sometimes uh, there are things that mm, you cannot control because I mean uh, what we ask you is to create a, a good uh, um, abstract outline this is the best you can do then uh, the program team will do all the work uh, behind the scene to create the best uh, schedule out there but if it if it gets rejected, it means uh, um, that basically they make the cut for the pro, uh, for the uh, for the for the schedule because mm -hmm. we have a very kind of limited amount of slots, right? So we cannot accommodate every single proposal up there, and um, and actually have I have a I don't know the answer to that. Maybe I ask the other uh, questions, Christian. So if uh, if uh, a proposal gets rejected, uh, are the authors uh, um, going to receive a, a feedback about the rejection or? I think this is not automatically sent, but if someone is interested in you know, the feedback, I think as the program committee, we could do something about it and provide at least not the the, the raw data of the, the reviews, yeah. but we can share the main idea of it. And yeah, it's really important because I mean, time to time people get really discouraged of being, the, I remember I, it took me many, many, many attempts in many conferences to start getting a talk accepted. And even this, I mean, this year, last year, I, I had some talks submitted to another conference that I was organizing and my proposals got rejected. So there are no free pass. doesn't matter if your organization or very famous because, and things are anonymous and of course at the end of the day the feeling that some people get that oh but this person or these people is always speaking at this conference because they have some friends with me it might be that they that people understood what is how and a good abstract is shaped in a way of like uh, submitting a good proposal and they have like <laughs> they hack the review process in a way of like submitting a well structured outline and everything so don't get discouraged. I have no any many many people that get lots of talks rejected, and they're really good at what they are doing. So it's uh, nothing to do with it. And sometimes, yeah. like maybe your proposal was really good, but there were other ten really goods, and we're gonna accept eleven in that specific topic. So don't get discouraged about it. Yeah, correct. Um, there is a, another question. Is it better when the ML talk titles are only involving ML name or to attach, for example, generative applications in Python to better prove the talk involves Python and not only ML theory? <laughs> this is also a good question because it has a double-edged sword. Yeah. I have read titles that say something, something in Python and the abstract doesn't mention anything about Python not the outline. So in that case, doesn't help. I would say that the title is, I, I see it as a two, two kind of like age thing. So reviewers will not only focus on the review, uh, sorry, in the title, but uh, also on the abstract. Of course, the title is what is getting the attention of people. So I will try to, if you believe adding in Python to your title, it's a good idea, do it. Uh, if not, I'd say that it's not so problematic. The interesting bit is that to show me in your abstract, not only the problem that you are solving, like, I don't know, doing some crazy quantum mechanic things, but show me what you are doing in Python. It doesn't need to be something too complex or weird. Like, just mention me, like, are you maybe providing an algorithm? Are you creating a little module? Are you doing some tests, some interface or something? As long as you can provide within the abstracts and the outline that you are showing things with Python or doing things with Python, that would be enough. So yeah. Okay. I think if we Wait, don't okay. have Sorry? more questions. Yeah, I think if we don't have more questions, like Let's wait yeah. for. Yeah. One for... thing I would like to share is that uh, I would like to say a big thanks to Diego, to Christian who joined today, and of course to other people that they are working uh, for the mentorship program of EuroPython, like uh, Maria is also in the call, and uh, also Na, who is uh, another volunteer who helps us this year. Uh, without all these people, this like 
this help, the matching that we make with the, the mentors and the mentees, the workshops and these sessions that we are giving to people in order to help them deliver their talk wouldn't be um, uh, we, we wouldn't be able to make. So a big thanks and a big hug to everyone helped for, for this session and for all the things that we will do in, inside the year. Yeah, uh, if uh, thanks, well, thank you, th thanks to you, Fanny, to drive all the uh, all the mentorship program. I think uh, is very uh, is a valuable tool, especially for first time speaker and or for people who approach for the first time this kind of conferences. So, I think I'm more than happy to help out uh, other people to get uh, closer to these uh, conferences. Um. Let's see, uh, let's give another extra 10 seconds to see if there is last minute question. If there aren't, then I guess we can call the day, maybe. Let me see if uh, we have anything else on the agenda. No, we don't. And we are reachable. I mean, as Diego mentioned, if you ping the EuroPython account on Mastodon or X or, or LinkedIn, people will react. Uh, the people helping yeah. with the conference are also following that so that we will see the interaction. We get mechanisms. Every time you write an email, also many people will get notified. So don't hesitate to, to yes. get in touch with us. Yeah. All right, it looks like that we don't have any other question. So thanks everyone for attending today. And uh, yeah, good luck uh, for your CFP. If you if you decide to uh, so, um, submit any proposal and hopefully see you soon. See you soon. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Bye.